Okay. Um, Dr. Bird just mentioned that uh, there was an article in the New York Times in June exposing the financial anomalies of shale gas. And it was quite a large article. I would encourage you all, if you get a chance, to pull it up online and particularly to go into the document reader. The Times did an incredible job um, of pulling emails from insiders within companies. I didn't say thank you for inviting me. I'm so sorry. Um, thank you for inviting me here. Um, anyway, they did an incredible job of ex um, pulling in emails and just putting the whole picture together in a very coherent fashion. And this is not an easy story to tell. I hope I'm going to do a good job tonight, but there's so many different aspects of it. And it's like a big puzzle that you have to put together um, uh, one piece at a time. Now, after the New York Times article, uh, a few weeks later, the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, came out and issued a number of subpoenas to shale gas companies. And um, a few weeks after that, the New York State Attorney General also began issuing subpoenas to shale gas companies. And then on the 24th, de the Department of Energy slashed the estimates in the Marcellus for the reserves by 80 percent. Um, so you may wonder, what's going on here? Why? Why the investigations? Why the slashing of numbers? That's what I'm hopefully going to um, answer a lot of those questions for you tonight. OK, why we should question shale gas. There's no doubt the gas exists in shale. That's a given. But shale gas has been touted as a cheap and abundant source of energy. Much emphasis has focused purely on the amount of gas trapped in shales, but much of this gas may never be commercially extractable unless natural gas prices rise dramatically. And in that case, natural gas, obviously, is no longer a cheap source of energy. Uh, sorry, my computer just went down. Um, something which must be considered when addressing not only inter national energy policy, but also the questions of how we allow our own regional areas, indeed our own neighborhoods, to be exploited for this res resource. The questions facing this city, this region, are the same facing every city and region where shale gas is found. It's important to shift, sift through all the hype and rhetoric to assess whether production can truly be counted on to provide benefits. For instance, is production as, as secure as it appears? Will jobs and taxes really be as stable as claimed? What will the environmental impacts really be? Can we count on energy independence from shale gas and unconventional oil? I've never seen anything hyped more than, than um, shale gas. Um, Wall Street loves a sexy story, and shale gas provided just that. It has incredible horizontal drilling techniques and uh, Hollywood pyrotechnics, which are the fracture stimulation. It was an easy sell to Wall Street. It started with the Barnett, then it moved to the Fayetteville, the Haynesville, the Marcellus, the Bakken, Eagle Fort. It's hopped the pond to Europe. We're now in China, India. Everybody is um, participating in what the industry calls the shale gas revolution. All the while, the hype has reached ever giddy heights, with every shale play claimed to be better than the last. We've all heard the slogans, game changer, national treasure, shale gas revolution, a hundred years of gas available and energy independence for all. But being ever the contrarian, I began to question shale gas several years ago. After years in the financial markets in Europe and the U.S., the one thing I've learned is that when an investment is hyped to this extent, you better beware. So let's look at some of the claims that have been made, and let's look at some of the, re the rhetoric versus reality. Jim Mulva, who's CEO of ConocoPhillips, says, if oil is the prize, the natural gas is the gift, nature's gift to the people of the world. But Platt's Oil and Gas Reporter, which is one of the preeminent industry uh, publications, had this to say about shale gas. The switch from shale gas to shale oil suggests shale gas can survive only through cross-subsidization, not on its own merit. Perpetual expansion cannot forever disguise a serious problem with the bottom line. I was so happy to see that. Um, Jim Mulva went on to say, gas can enhance the energy supply security through its abundance. There's enough to meet industrial, residential, commercial, and power generation needs, basically, for the next hundred years. But Bernstein Research, who is probably our preeminent oil and gas financial research company in New York, said recent frac data from the Barnett, which I'm from the Barnett, by the way. That's where I live, sorry. Um, and the Barnett was the first shale place. So it has, I'm going to talk a lot about the Barnett tonight because it, we have the most, um, we have the longest track record. We have the most historical production that you can actually check numbers on now. 
Um, and so they said, recent frac data from the Barnett shows a play in severe decline. The Barnett's well failure rate also continues to rise over time. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, the U.S. Geological Survey recently came out and slashed their estimates, which in turn the DOE slashed theirs by 80% for the Marcellus Shale. So it makes one wonder if the Marcellus was our largest um, shale play, and it is now, the reserve estimates have now been slashed 80%, where that 100 year supply of gas is going to come from. <coughs> production versus reserves. There appears to be a great deal of confusion regarding production versus reserves. A leading argument states that shale gas has risen from 2% of all natural gas production in 2000 to 23% 10 years later, a statistic the MIT group called a paradigm shift. But this is misleading unless you put it into context, because drilling for conventional gas, in other words, what we've always done, which is just a vertical wellbore rather than the horizontal going down um, vertically and then coming out horizontally, um, conventional gas began to wane in this country in the 70s. So when shale gas burst on the scene, Wall Street was only too happy to invest billions in this sexy new story. Consequently, investment in conventional gas pro projects has been absolutely decimated. There's no money. It completely dried up. So shale gas has grown as a percentage of all natural gas, but it's been at the expense of conventional gas projects. It is not, and I want to repeat that, it is not adding to existing and growing existing supplies of gas. It's merely replacing them. Um, EIA estimates that natural gas, natural gas will only grow about 0.8% per annum through 2030 because conventional projects will be depleting during that time and, and they, they're not being replaced. They're being replaced by shale gas. They're not being replaced by other conventional gas projects. So is this a boom? Well, it's certainly been characterized as a boom. But it makes sense to look at some of the underlying reasons for this precipitous rise in production. It's a fact that while gas, pr gas prices were plummeting, many shale companies continued to drill rather than shut in wells. Shutting in wells has always been the traditional approach to low prices for the industry. Shale wells were depleting so quickly, however, um, that the wells had to be drilled continuously to maintain cash flow. Given the very, very heavy debt burdens of some of these shale gas operators, drilling was the only way to meet debt service. So financial analysts and journalists began referring to this back in late 2009, early 2010 as a drilling treadmill. They couldn't get off. An excellent example of this can be seen by examining the audit accounts of the city of Fort Worth, which is where I live, in the Barnett Shale Play. In 2008, the city received approximately $50 million in revenues from gas. This dropped precipitously in 2009 to about $19 million. In 2010, it began to trend back up and closed the year at approximately 38. On the surface, it would seem that things were recovering from the economic downturn and returning to normal. That's certainly the, the spin that industry put on it. However, the first question I asked was, I want to know the number of wells that have been drilled between 2008 and 2010. And what I found was that the number of producing wells within the city grew fourfold. They more than quadrupled. So even though there were now four times more wells, they were only able to produce about two-thirds of the original revenues. Um, and this is due to the severe depletion rates of shale gas wells. By the way, this pattern has occurred repeatedly in North Texas. For instance, Denton County saw a 58% increase in the number of wells for a 23% decrease in revenues. The wells at DFW Airport have come in with dismal returns. Um, they never came anywhere close to original projections and have now plummeted so precipitously that at year-end, geologists are expecting them year in 2011 to produce less than one-tenth the original projections. The University of Texas at Arlington revenues peaked at about seven million with a mere six wells to plummet drastically in a matter of months. Revenues in 2010 were down to about 800,000, even though there are now 22 wells on campus. So while wells were pro proliferating and revenues plummeting, however, uh, gas drilling was providing something else, pollution and environmental degradation. The city of Fort Worth just completed um, their first ever environmental impact study. We're not big on that in Texas, environmental impact studies. Um, and of course, we do it after the fact. And what they found was most unfortunate. 
benzene has been detected at 94% of all the sites tested within the city proper. That's in addition to formaldehyde, carbon disulfide, and other reduced sulfur compounds. Um, lots of other um, not very pleasant things that you would want to breathe. Um, and they're all contributing to a toxic cocktail, basically. They were supposed to have done dispersion modeling, and that got nixed at the sometime during the study. I think we can all kind of draw conclusions on why that. Do you understand about dispersion modeling? That's where they take what they found at the individual sites, and then they extrapolate out how these compounds will impact an entire region. And um, that was uh, part of the original plan. It was part of the original contract, and it was never done. I think there was a little political um, motivation behind that. Uh, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality has now confirmed that drilling contributes more air toxics than all cars, trucks, and airplanes combined in our region. And that got cut off, but DFW has now um, gained the dubious distinction of having passed Houston, Texas as uh, having the most air toxics and the dirtiest air in our state. And um, for any of you who've ever been to Houston, you know that that's saying something. Um, not something that you should be particularly proud of. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm getting over a cold and I have this froggy voice. Okay, let's talk about jobs and economic activity because that's something that we hear a lot about when um, shale gas comes to town. Interestingly enough, a recent study by Penn State found that original claims by industry here in the Marcellus region uh, had been pretty much vastly overstated. Actual impacts had been about half the jobs and economic activity reported in earlier industry-funded studies. It is important whenever you read about a study to find out who funded it because if it's a glowing report on shale gas, you will find that industry has, um, has actually um, paid for it at the end of the day. So they also found out that only 18% of the municipalities directly experiencing drilling activities said that their tax revenues had increased, while 26% of the local governments indicated that their costs had increased. This is a problem that we're seeing in all the shale plays around the country. Um, you, you have a lot of truck traffic with these plays, and so your roads get torn up. There, there are, now the city of Fort Worth has had to spend well over a million dollars on this environmental impact study. We're going to have to spend money on ongoing testing. The state of Texas is now implementing a 24-hour air monitoring system in the Barnett Shell region, and that's costing and that costs anywhere from about 250 to 300 thousand dollars per monitor. And we've got this drilling going on in 23 counties now, so it's going to be expensive. At the end of the day. Um, but I thought it would be interesting to compare, since you, you have uh, this study coming out of Penn State, it would also be interesting to compare and show you that the same thing has happened or did happen uh, to us earlier on in Texas. Um, industry hired the Perryman Group, who claimed that 111,000 direct industry jobs were from shale production in North Texas alone in 2008. I did a little bit of checking and found out that there were only 166,000 total jobs onshore and offshore in the United States in oil and gas, and we were to believe that 111,000 of those were in the Dallas-Fort Worth region. Chesapeake Energy also claimed last year that 53,200 direct jobs were now in shale production in only the Fort Worth-Arlington area, uh, not in the 23-county area. And again, I looked, and there were only 93,000 total jobs onshore and offshore for the entire U.S. Uh, so I will let you draw your own conclusions about industry's math when it comes to jobs. Record capacity. Industry likes to tell us that we're sitting at record capacity, and we are, thanks to thousands and thousands of new wells that have been drilled over the last few years to keep many of these operators from declaring bankruptcy and meet dead service. This, which in my opinion, is a mismanagement of natural resources has produced record capacity driving prices lower still and keeping them lower. So while there's no doubt that we're sitting at record supply capacity, it may be for the wrong reasons. Further, if this capacity is the product of the drilling treadmill, where as we've seen more wells cannot keep production up because older wells are depleting so quickly, then it can very reasonably be argued in my opinion that there's very little depth or security behind this record capacity. Once you let up on the drilling, supplies are going to tumble very quickly indeed. Record capacity, however, when you talk about it 
um, over and over and over again in the media instills a notion in the public that shale gas is both extremely cheap and enorm um, extremely cheap and enormously abundant, when in fact this may be a false sense of security. Um, one statistic that's bandied about constantly is that the U.S. now has a 100-year supply of natural gas, thanks in large part to the shale plays. As I said, I'd like to see the numbers now that the reserves have been slashed. Um, but something which is very important to consider is that these estimates do not take into account the cost of extracting the gas. And this is where I'd like to go next, to the financial anomalies that have cropped up with regard to costs and SEC reporting and even shareholder destruction. Okay. Um, according to production history filed by the operators in various states, shale gas volumes have not turned out to be as homogeneous as we once thought. In the early days of any of these plays, it was widely touted that you could drop a drill bit in and you were going to hit gas pretty much any place. Uh, Aubrey McClendon admitted, however, to Bloomberg that there was a time when you were all told that any of the 17 counties in the Barnett Shale play would be just as good as any other county. We found out that there were about two and a half counties where you really want to be. Yet even within those core areas, which is what they talk about when they're the, the two and a half counties, they call them core areas, production can be erratic in there. Geologists in Houston have now examined um, about 9,100 of the, they've actually done more since then, but uh, 9,100 of the 15,000 wells in the Barnett, and this is data taken from the Railroad Commission filed with the state. So this isn't data that they, you know, numbers that they made up. They, take the, they took the data from the Railroad Commission. And what they have found is that less than 6% of all the wells in North Texas meet minimum economic thresholds. Further, Dr. John Lee, who was the architect for the SEC of their rule change for oil and gas, said in an email dated to me last March that 20% of shale wells carry a project. The other 80% can easily be uneconomic. So I borrowed this slide from my geologist buddies. And um, just to kind of give you a, a visual on this, that blue area are where the, the, the gas well, th that is a carpet of gas wells. Every place you see blue is a carpet of gas wells. Every place you see red is a gas well that actually made money. So I think that that is um, pretty stark. Since the SEC rule change for oil and gas was adopted in 2009, companies can now claim reserves that were previously not allowed and book them without a mandatory third-party audit. Now, I don't mind them being able to claim reserves that previously weren't allowed. I think there's a good argument to be made that, um, that they needed more um, leeway, so to speak, um, to claim more reserves. The problem I have with it is that the SEC is not requiring them to have these independently audited. So basically, they can tell us these are our reserve figures and we have to just take them at their word. I don't think that's a very good place to be. This may have opened the door, in my opinion, to optimistic assumption making. There's a clear upside to being able to book more reserves. It's the ability to make it appear that growth is occurring within your company and that finding costs are plummeting. But is this really the case? In November 2009, Mark Papa of EOG Resources told financial analysts that those that select to book liberally can have extremely low finding costs, and those that book more conservatively can have higher finding costs. EOG went on to increase reserve estimates by more than 135% after the rule change, immediately, 135%. And other shale gas companies did the same. Some of them, like Petrohawk, increased their estimates by much, as much as 200%. Such massive reserve revisions may make a company appear to be much more attractive than it may really be. And in turn, it can also allow such companies to borrow more monies. And this is borrowing more monies on reserves that have not been independently verified. We don't know whether they're there or not. Borrowing more money on assets that are not required to be independently verified is obviously problematic. Industry experts and officials often state that costs drop dramatically with the economic downturn. But while overall costs did drop throughout 2009, the dramatic drop in costs seen in some of these shale gas companies cannot be completely explained away by this factor. In a report dated October 2010, sorry, I'm freezing. I'm from Texas, and it's cold in here. Um, <laughs> Ernst & Young stated that for the oil and gas industry, finding and development costs decreased an average of 48%. 
These declines, they said, were driven by the previously discussed decreases in all categories of spending, but along with res strong reserve additions. At five of the seven shale gas companies that I looked at, however, um, the cost dropped considerably more than the overall market average. These were the same companies that had chosen to increase their reserve estimates, in interestingly enough, uh, some by as much as 200%. So let's look at some of these. For instance, PetroHawks finding and development costs in 2008 were $51.50, but under the and that was under the old reserve estimates. They then plunged in the first quarter reporting um, to $7.03 under the new estimates, an overall decline of 86%. And I, I'm assuming you understand how that works. I mean, if you you have to, the way they do this. They say, they take their costs and they divide it into the reserve figures and they say, so we can pull this gas out of the ground for $4 MCF. Um, well, if you've increased your reserve figures, you now have a much bigger, a much bigger um, number to divide these costs into. So it makes it look like your, your costs are plummeting. Are they? Well, you know, that's a good question. Comstock Resources and PetroQuest also had similar declines in excess of 75%. Range Resources and Chesapeake tied at 66% well in excess of the average 48% seen amongst all oil and gas producers. EOG was the only one of the companies that I studied uh, whose declines were more in line with the 48% decrease. But these plummeting cost figures raise questions because the reserve estimates that they are based on, again, they've not been independently verified. Further, more, many companies in their reporting don't even include the sunk costs, such as le lease costs, uh, bonuses paid up front. By breaking these out, it can appear that costs are lower still, but leases have to be paid for. These are costs, and they need to be factored back in. And when they are, costs can again rise significantly. Going back to Dr. Lee's statement, um, he said, with proper averaging and a large enough sample of wells, we believe that we can predict the average outcome of a drilling program without the ability to predict the outcome of drilling any individual well. If we don't have enough wells, he said, for valid statistics for what we've already drilled, or if we don't have enough future drilling opportunities to have reasonable expectations of average outcome, then we may have to write down our assets as some are doing. Now, keep in mind this statement. We were told in North Texas that these wells were good to go for at least 30 to 40 years. Okay? But he's saying here that um, if we do not have enough future drilling opportunities, to have reasonable expectations, then we may have to write down our assets. Well, let's look at what they did. That's exactly what they did. The shale companies began writing down assets in 2009. Impairment charges as a percentage of total shareholder equity has been enormous at some of these companies. In fact, I keep trying to figure out, well, anyway, that's a personal opinion. I don't need to give that. Uh, Petrohawk charged off assets as impairments that accounted for 185% of total shareholder equity. Um, in between 2008 and 2010. Quicksilver Resources has charged off an incredible 151%. Chesapeake, 115%. Devon, 102%. Range also took a hefty impairment charge in quarter one of this year when they sold off all their Barnett shale assets of about half a billion dollars. I haven't worked out the percentage on that, but um, I believe just in doing the numbers in my head, it's somewhere around 40 to 45 percent just on their Barnett Shale assets. Um, obviously, these charges are problematic when considering shareholder value destruction. <coughs> so, if you go back and you think about what uh, the geologist said that, um, well, what Dr. Lee said, that 80% of the wells can easily be uneconomic within a shale play. And shale plays, because of the horizontal drilling, they tend to cover vast areas of land. They go in and they set up a grid pattern. And in Texas, and this is the way they'll do most of the shale plays, they run them at about every half a mile or so. You have a pad site, north, south, east, and west. And it's on a grid. And so you're looking for that 20% of all of those wells you're looking for the 20% that are actually going to hit a big pocket of gas and make you a lot of money. But the other 80%, as he says, can be easily uneconomic. His words, not mine. Um, the geologists running the numbers on the Barnett in Texas have found that uh, over 90% of the wells have been easily uneconomic. So you have to ask the question, is this the highest and best use of our land? I mean, I think it's a, it's a very valid question. Environmental costs can be huge. 94% of the sites, as I said, in Fort Worth 
have a known carcinogen being emitted 24-7. Water is permanently removed from the hydrological cycle in spite of growing population in the, in the region and particularly in the urban areas. So these are questions that I think are very relevant and, and they need to be addressed. Um, there's an answer out there, but we at least need to address them and ask the questions of the operators and of our policymakers. <coughs> so let's begin to put, piece this puzzle together. Production is at the expense of conventional projects, so it isn't, and it isn't really, uh, well, production is at the expense of con conventional projects. Reserves do not have to be independently verified. Jobs have been overstated. Revenues and taxes have been overstated. Well decline curves are very steep, so security of supply is questionable. And reserve estimates have jumped considerably on company books, but, but they haven't been independently verified. This is not a pretty picture when you start looking at all these different fa facets of this. So then we get to the question which always arises, and I'm going to preempt you because I know somebody's going to ask me this question. If shale gas is such a dud, why are the majors falling all over themselves to invest in it. Okay, the first thing you have to keep in mind is that for these companies, there are two sets of economics. Um, it's what there's, the first set is what I call the field economics. What are the wells actually doing? What are my costs? What, what does it actually cost me to drop that drill bit into the ground um, and pull the gas out? That's what I call field economics. Then you get to the second set of economics, which is what I call the street economics. And that is, how do I keep my share price propped up and in good shape? And in that case, I have to play another game, or I like to say it's really more of a dance with financial analysts and keep them promoting my stock all the time. So um, is everybody following me on that one? Okay, good. The better your prospects look, obviously, the more money uh, bankers and institutions are willing to pump into your business, and that's the name of the game at the end of the day. The fact is that the majors across the board have not been able to grow reserves for over a decade. And let me repeat that. The majors across the board have not grown reserves for over a decade. So you have stocks that are essentially these behemoth companies that are stagnant. They're not growing and they don't really have much prospect for growth, or they haven't had for the last 10 years. If a company can't show growth and future prospects, then its share price ultimately will languish. Because of the new SEC rules, however, the majors can now claim reserves that um, have not been necessarily verified. I keep pushing that, but I think it's important that, that I get that through. And it appears that the majors, it can appear now that the majors are growing. Their, their reserves are growing. So that's a good place to be if you're promoting your stock. Industry has had a two-pronged approach, and I'd like to move on to this as the final part of the analysis, and then I'll open it up for questions. Um, and uh, Sorry. Two-pronged approach, which is the Pickens Plan, which is the mass conversion of power plants and truck fleets to natural gas in the U.S., which you may have heard because T. Boone Pickens is on television, as best I can tell, about every five minutes. And the rest of the time, he's in uh, congressional offices um, lobbying as best he can. And then the other part of that two-pronged approach is shale exportation, and that has been done very, very quietly behind the scenes. The Pickens plan has not been quiet at all. Shale gas exportation um, has been very quiet. We now know, <coughs> pardon me, well, let's just go on to this. Um, amid all the fanfare and media blitz, something else in the form of shale gas exporta exportation was going on. And the plan was they wanted, they started um, going to Washington and asking that our LNG terminals, which are liquid natural gas terminals, that were import terminals for this country because, as I said before, conventional gas has been waning since the 70s. We were beginning to import natural gas into this country. And you have, in order to move natural gas by ship, you have to convert it to LNG, liquid natural gas. So we had import terminals, which, by the way, um, some of that land was, was gained through eminent domain, and that opens up a whole new um, set of, and you can do that for imports. But now they've asked, Washington to flip those terminals and make them export terminals. 
and uh, they actually received their first permit for an export terminal flip at Sabine Pass. Uh, it went through about two or three weeks ago. So you may ask, why is this happening? Asian markets, that's why it's happening. Uh, the price of natural gas in Asia is tied, it's indexed to the price of crude oil. They don't pay the Henry Hub price, the domestic U.S. price that we pay. Uh, in fact, while gas trades currently here at around $4 right now, it's trading at roughly 12 to 15 in Asia, depending on the length of the contracts. So operators can extract, pipe, refine, and ship to Asia for about $9, and they can sell their product for about 15 that is a very nice spread, and you will make a lot of money doing that. Um, it's about treble what the domestic market is paying at the current price. I mean, at the, yeah, at the current price. And um, I think these quotes are quite interesting. Um, this is from Oil and Gas Financial Journal. The Chinese are willing to pay a premium to secure North American resources necessary to feed the gro growing Asian economy. If you've kept up with shale plays at all in the news, you'll note that quite a number of uh, joint ventures have been done with um, the Koreans, the Chinese, etc., cetera, um, selling off our production in this country um, and, and in Canada as well. Shell, I mean, you can't be any more straightforward than this. Shell has placed a big emphasis on North American gas. It's an area of growth for us. We've invested something like 15 billion since 2004 in the onshore sector. What we develop here, we'd like to export to the rest of the world. Now that doesn't play in very well with the populist argument that, or statements that you hear from industry that this is American gas extracted for Americans by Americans um, and that it's going to save us from international terrorism. Uh, by having domestic energy security because out the back door the shale gas is going to Asia. So um, <coughs> here's where it gets kind of tricky. We just talked about that. Sorry, I'm, I'm a little bit off. Let's say you're an, you, you as an operator convince Congress to legislate the Pickens plan. And um, in this country we begin mass conversion of power plants, truck fleets, etc. And we now become much more dependent upon natural gas because we think, and we've been told, that it's a cheap and abundant source of energy. So you're now being paid handsomely, if you're the operator, for that gas. Um, sorry, in the meantime, you begin to export um, American natural gas to Asian countries to grow their economies. You're now being paid quite handsomely, um, much better in Asia than you are in the domestic market for your product. And as we know, the market's going to rise. I mean, it's, it's whatever the market will bear at the end of the day. So the domestic prices are inevitably going to rise when um, exportation becomes a big factor in this game. Um, this is fantastic if you're an operator because you'll be making money hand over fist. But what if you're an American consumer? If you're an American consumer, you have now, thanks to the genius of Congress, converted your electricity to be dependent upon natural gas. Manufacturers have, um, they're ramping up production. Plastics is ramping up production as we speak because they claim natural gas is a cheap and abundant source. So they're going to use it as feedstock for plastics and they're talking about we're going to bring jobs back to the U.S. Uh, because natural gas is so cheap. Truck fleets used to transport goods are now going to be dependent upon natural gas to move inventory around the country. Only now, natural gas prices have gone through the roof thanks to exportation and Asian demand. And I'm going to let Aubrey McClendon, CEO of Chesapeake Energy, tell you what happens when natural gas prices go through the roof. He actually made this statement a few months ago at the Marcellus Insights Shale Conference in um, Pennsylvania. And he was talking about fractivist, what he calls fractivist, people, environmental um, zealots, who he, he refers to them in, as environmental zealots, and that if, um, if they got their way and shale gas wasn't allowed free reign, um, that this is what would happen, he said. Natural gas prices, if they went through the roof because they couldn't extract shale gas in this country, then 70% of American homes on natural gas heat will be cold. 35% of American homes and businesses and factories that use electricity from natural gas will be dark. And crops that require natural gas fertilizer will not be grown. He called this a very stark future. I agree. 
but I think that that's exactly what's going to happen because it is inevitable that prices will go through the roof once exportation is um, a big factor in this game. And um, you're going to have essentially what I'd call the classic consumer squeeze. We will have much higher prices and we will be dependent upon um, natural gas in a much greater capacity than we are now. But the operators will have made a very handy profit. And um, that's the name of the game when you're in business. So I think in closing that that's, those are questions that we need to consider and we need to think about as a nation and as individual regions, um, cities, um, and make sure that we are, are making the right decisions for our own communities. Do we really want to, um, where is the tipping point? I was talking to some, some students this afternoon uh, at St. Lawrence University, and where is the tipping point? Where is it where the revenues no longer are making sense? Now you've tipped over and the environmental degradation is going to be greater than the revenues that you're getting, the economic benefit. And that's going to happen in every play. I mean, that's inevitable. And you have to determine where is that tipping point going to be and how much environmental degradation am I willing to live with in order to get this upfront economic benefit? Because there is an economic benefit up front. There's no doubt about it. But it probably is not as long-lived as they would have us believe. So thank you.